this event possible. Uh, I'm going to have a, so I'm going to present to you uh, uh, through a few introductory words uh, the reason of that topic. Uh, so the, the enemy is an immemorial figure rooted in our imaginations. So the later also called the adversary relating to the biblical figure of Satan is located at the art of the European, Mediterranean, and Middle Eastern pre-modern worlds and culture playing a very central role in the free monotheisms of Judaism, Christianism, and Islam. Satan is a prototypical figure of temptation, setting doubt and disorder. Also known under the name of Lucifer, the bringer of dawn or the morning star, he is the former purveyor of light who became a fallen angel. His rebellion and ban have been sung and narrated in an exemplary manner by the British poet John Milton in Paradise Lost in 1667. Two centuries later, he is celebrated as the Prince of Exile by the French poet Charles Baudelaire with Les Litanies de Satan in Les Fleurs du Mal, The Flower of Evil, in 1857. This figure can never take different form, faces, or genders. Lilith, the female demon who has the capacity to take the shape of diverse nocturnal animals, is already present in different Sumerian, Assyrian, and Babylonian traditions. This adversary, previously known as a light bringer, eventually condemned by divine justice to an unending exile, both physical and spiritual, could be an impeccable metaphor reflecting the uses and misuses of ideologies and identities and the very important function that affects 
and emotions are playing out within the realm of reason, which like our whole world views and understandings is incredibly limited. As Gershom Sholem reminds us in the Jewish Kabbalistic tradition, Satan or evil is the product of a crisis ascending through the severity of divine judgment. Its advent occurs during the development of that great fire of anger that burns in God, which is normally tempered by his mercy. But when the latter is no longer sufficient to appease this prioritus, an imbalance operates, an energy exhales and breaks away from the divine, finding its own autonomy, that is evil. This dialectic between evil and freedom has been highlighted by the German philosopher Rudiger Safransky uh, in his uh, 1999 essay, Evil or the Tragedy of Freedom. Freedom, free will, and the issue of establishment of norms and laws are inseparable from political action, something that essentially defines power as Michel Foucault state. In his critical violence essay written in 1921, during the first years of existence of the Weimar Republic in defeated Germany, Walter Benjamin questions the relationships between divine violence, justice, and power in a secular society. As he asserts, lawmaking is power making, and to that extent, an immediate manifestation of violence. Justice is the principle of all divine end making, the power of the principle of all mythical law making. In any legislative power lies the notion of divine, just, uh, divine violence, which naturally questions a certain approach and conception of law and lawmaking, of justice, and well beyond that, a certain idea of history, ways of embracing and translating imaginaries that are palpable. What we can inquire through the notion of constructing the enemy is how and to what purpose identities are defined. All this identity conception and perception encapsulate symbolic powers draw boundaries and thus unveils a certain definition of sovereignty. We find within the triangle theory constituted by identity, sovereignty, and power, the potentialities of racial hatred, anti-Semitism, and Islamophobia, depending on ethical and moral judgments and actions related to the political and legislative power and language that structures imaginaries and penetrates the unconscious from one generation to another. This sort of dominant impetus uh, we entertain in relation to identity might operate individually in our intimacies through projections of desire, but also through the nurturing of resentment in its most Nietzschean sense, and feelings of incompleteness, which become political leverages in times of socioeconomic and political crisis. The need for recognition and authority in a society structured by norms, the alleged importance of the gaze of others in a globalized consumer society, and all our own image is perceived uh, we can consider here Guy Debord's critic in his essay, The Society of Spectacle, in 1967, tightened by the obsession of defining and categorizing by so-called majorities and minorities, are, has contributed in shaping cultural imperialism, but also predatory views on environment and others. This dominant propensity as fashion or intellects, identities, territories, even our intimacies, setting a cultural unconscious that determines our futures in the dead angle of reason. The enmeshment of political, economic, cultural, and identity threats has created a very specific definition of the border, something that appears as crucial or vital to our ontological integrity and alleged survival. Each time this border is crossed by an alleged or defined alien, adversary or enemy, the strength of cultural differentiations, the legacy of geocentrism, the assumed need to protect a territory defined as the property of a proclaimed majority enacts and legitimizes a hideous hatred unleashed to the face of the other, defined and perceived as a threatening beyond, and another that symbolically represents death. This fear of dispossession, of disappearance, of the weakening of its own image reappears nowadays in the rhetoric used by far-right parties, but gets also unfortunately instrumentalized by Republicans, sometimes socio-democratic, parties and elected representatives in France, Germany, Austria, Italy, Poland, Hungary, and of course in the United States of America. French secularism, also called laïcité, has been ideologically instrumentalized to mark the French Muslim community in times of political instability and global terrorism. The Muslims, their culture, faith, and customs have been far too often essentialized in order to create a set of repulsion and fear distorting the numerous economic, geopolitical, and post-colonial failures which are at the origin of extremist religious violences, which are most of the time targeting the Muslim on the first place in North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the Middle East. 
The return of extreme anti-Semitic violences, such as the synagogue massacre that occurred last October 27th in Pittsburgh, the torture and burning of an Holocaust survivor, Mireille Pinol, age 85, by a group of young men in France in March 2018, the increasing profanation and degradation of mosques and Muslim cemeteries in France since the last seven years, the entrance in the German Bundestag for the first time since the Second World War of an identitarian and racist party such as the AfD, Alternative for Germany, campaigning against the notoriously baptized refugee crisis and against the offensively called Islamization of Europe, all these horrendous events should question us about our progressive ethical and political disengagement as citizens in our Western democracies in the last two decades and probably certainly since the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. In the aftermath of the decolonization and Shoah periods, what the scholars Alejandro Bell and Nathan Snyder have crystallized through the notion of ethics of never again, having its famous French equivalent in the idea of devoir de mémoire, duty of remembering, seem to have been at the same time constantly weakened and proclaimed. Srebrenica, Chechnya, Randa are the names of a city, a republic, and a country that resonates with the remembrances of promises never hold. The figure of an enemy necessarily constructed arises again. Two wars in Iraq, the second invasion of Afghanistan, the international keynote of an unending civil war in Syria has allowed the rise of a Salafist monster that seems to reflect the features of an ethical and political immoral and irresponsible Western face in the supposed post-colonial period. A period which in fact could rather be considered as neo-colonial under the name of economic interest under the rubble of democracy. Anti-Semitism, racial hatred, Islamophobia are progressing as the last electoral results in many European countries and in the United States reflect. The status of refugees and migrants fleeing wars and disastrous humanitarian conditions in Libya, Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, or Saharan countries is permanently questioned and used as a scarecrow. European conservative governments, which are at once defending a globalized market economy and the permeability of borders of for merchandisers, want to strengthen their immigration laws, implementing in an alleged open and free market economy racial and ethnic aspects, as the study of Sandro Metzadra and Brett Nelson shows, borders and ethics, for instance. Yet, these situations in those countries are also the result of catastrophic European and American political meddling that have been diagnosed by far too many commentators and scholars, such as Noam Chomsky, Nicolas Mietzoev, um, WGT Mitchell, or more recently, in an exemplary manner, by Ashil Membre. In such paradoxical circumstances, where economic ideology and expressionism meets conservatism, populism and the racial unconscious, the necessity to create and delocalize political concerts inside or outside of the national borders become a geopolitical issue where questions of sovereignty and power, the capacity to let live and let die, to punish or threaten, requires an idiosyncratic enemy that might conflate with René Girard's notion of the scapegoat, which precisely becomes a mean to achieve consent and satisfaction in the community in a period of crisis or disorder. The enemy converts as a lever of governance to raise the majority blessing that should, at least locally, enable a temporary political equilibrium. Through the emblematic and tyrannical figure of the enemy, the secular world has been able to reclaim and influence a cultural territory deeply rooted in our collective unconscious to produce consent. This consent is crucial to the sovereign or to the state in order to rule. If, as Michel Foucault puts it in a series of lectures at the Collège de France, pastoral tradition from the old world was one of the essential components in the exercise of power. This very same tradition remains central in the modern world, a world that strengthens its borders, territories, and identities, but also a world that needs more economic, political, and territorial permeability to benefit from an economic growth to expand and conquer new spaces which permanently are, at the same time, socioeconomic, political, and cultural. As we can see, Antonio Gramsci's notion of hegemony, and particularly of cultural hegemony, is a key concept sustaining the nature of any geopolitical power and agonistic relations. The issue of exercise of freedom in the liberal and neoliberal world is fundamentally linked to a specific form of sovereignty. Majority consent is necessary for the exercise of a certain economic and political power based on mass productivity, the mass being here perceived as an alienated concept that doesn't allow for differentialism. As we can see, the majority paradigm is therefore needed for a certain conception and use of power. Uh, I would like to thank our guest. Uh, and <laughs> So 
So um, I'd like to thank you first for being here. Uh, we're very pleased to see you here. And uh, uh, I would like to, to thank um, uh, very dearly uh, Professor Ralph Buchenhorst from the Department of Philosophy at Emory University in Atlanta. Professor Bruno Shawat, that you already know from the Department of French and Italian at the University of Minnesota. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Professor Marwan Mohammed uh, had a lot of issues by taking his plane. There has been a snowstorm in New York, and he's right now coming to us, but he might be uh, in the impossibility to take part of the discussion. Uh, if that is so, we are going to read his paper uh, so that you can uh, have a glance at his ideas on that topic. Uh, but we want, uh, and I want personally to thank him because he has been very inspiring in thinking that end. Uh, uh, and I would like to thank very much our distinguished discussant and respondent uh, that agreed uh, to take part at this uh, event, Professors Hassan Abdel Salam, Akim Abderazak, Patricia Lorsin, Leslie Maurice, Matthias Rote, and Talbin Saman. Thank you very much to all of you and uh, enjoy uh, this afternoon. introduction and uh, Selim for putting this together and also for your impassioned uh, introduction I hope I will be able to measure up with that <laughs> passion uh, you will see that my fellow is in the quotation marks more more on this later I'd like to begin with some uh, general remarks on the striking illustration chosen by Selim uh, 
it works? Yes. Chosen, it's probably not this one, but it doesn't matter. So a chosen by Selim for the symposium. Faces defaced from Bosch to Francis Bacon to uh, Goya, Henri Michaud, apologies for the, we have to give them all. Henri Michaud, uh, or of course, uh, Edvard uh, Munch. Disfiguration and eventual effacement of the face bears witness to a certain conception of the human in the Judeo-Christian tradition. In the image of God, man sins and is bereft of that original likeness. Defacement has a theological resonance. It is a result of man's disobedience and thirst for knowledge. It is the original instance of hubris. Emmanuel Levinas has built his whole ethical philosophy on the figure of the face. Defacement for Levinas means dehumanization. In the 70s, Deleuze and Gattari would dismantle Levinas' face and celebrate disfiguration as a political, supposedly anti-imperialist move. Anti-humanistic and antinomian in essence, Deleuze and Gattari's philosophy was a glorification of deterritorialization. The face, according to them, re-territorializes the human within the likeness to God. It is not by chance that they will be fascinated with Francis Bacon's defaced faces. I won't dwell here on the controversies regarding the face in Levinas' thought. Is it a figure? Is it literally a face? Suffice it to say that Levinas, in Levinas' ethical regime, I can either acknowledge the other in his or her infinite vulnerability, or alternatively, I can decide to refuse to look at his face. I can ignore him, turn away from him, pretty much what we do to avoid embarrassment or shame when a beggar asks us for money. For Levinas, ethics, to look at the face amounts to being dispossessed by the demand that the other addresses to me. Recognizing the face of the other for Levinas does not amount to, amount to an objectifying gaze, quite the opposite. It means to acknowledge the other's subjectivity. However, this recognition is not Hegelian. It is beyond the symmetrical reversal at work in the master-servant dialectic. The other for Levinas is never symmetrical with me. He or she is higher than me. In situations of violence, the need is great to pretend that the other has no face. Effacing the face is a common psychological and political tactic used in modern warfare and a fortiori in genocidal violence. The war of yesteryear was Hegelian. It responded to the economy of the dual as in Conrad's story and its remarkable adaptation by Ridley Scott, the dualists. Since the First World War, conflicts are, I would argue, post-Hegelian. The enemy has no face. In 20 minutes, uh, I will only offer some avenues of reflection in a very rhapsodic form. My talk is open, it's inconclusive, and it's meant only to provoke some discussion. For those of you who enjoy the exhilarating TV show Black Mirror, who, no one, <laughs> some, few, <coughs> Uh, may recall an episode in which a black soldier of an army in a post-apocalyptic dystopia 
is sent on a mission to exterminate the enemy, the so-called Roaches. The Roaches, we soon realize, are monstrous mutants, nightmarish chimeras that seem to come straight out, it's terrible, out of a Lovecraft novella. Gradually, the soldier experiences strange sensations, consults the military doctor, and we understand that soldiers have been, quote unquote, augmented or modified with neuro implants after having been screened to see if there is any glitch in his MASS, the acronym of the neuro implant system. He goes back to war in devastated post-urban landscapes reminiscent of Cormac McCarthy's The Road and Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket. Ambushed by a sniper, he reaches the hideout place and encounters, instead of a human cockroach, a young woman and her child recoiled in terror. We soon find out that these neuro implants, now dysfunctional, were meant to prevent him and his fellow soldiers from perceiving the human mutants for what they really are, that is, fellow humans hunted like vermin by the rest of the population. The so-called NASS system is thus meant to facilitate the hunting and killing of innocent civilians by destroying empathy through a neurologically induced dehumanization of the victims. This transparent allegory of genocide, Roach, of course, cannot fail to recall the way in which the Hutus called the Tutsis during the Rwanda genocide, could very well foreshadow the moral dilemmas of our uh, uh, trans or post-human future. Indeed, the enemy is not Jewish or racially different. He is genetically deficient. His DNA indicates potential diseases and weaknesses. This episode illustrates with lucidity the process of dehumanization and of ideologically or technologically induced psychosis. In order to mass murder, in order for, his, for excuse me, for mass murder to be effective, empathy must be destroyed and the enemy turned into a non-human, which means that the ideology, state propaganda, and in this case, neurological augmentation is the tool that creates an alternative reality and induces collective psychosis. What propaganda had done all too well up until now, perhaps neurotechnology will be able to achieve tomorrow, that is a large scale manufacture of hatred. In an incisive short book on hatred, Psychoanalyst Hélène Leuillet explains genocidal crime by calling forth the concept of induced psychosis. In psychosis, she writes, and I quote, acting out occurs in a state of hallucination in which the subject receives the commandment to kill as though from the outside, end quote. So we see voices tell me to kill, God tells me to kill, the Führer commands me to kill. To be sure, in science fiction, neuro implants bypasses discourse, no need for the mediation of language. The hallucination is technologically induced. Technology replaces ideology. The subject is wired, as it were, to kill. He's not a natural born killer, but an artificially manufactured one. This induced psychosis, whether via technology or ideology, is predicated upon conspiracy theory. Those you are commanded to kill are conspiring against you. It's kill or be killed. Jews are the elders of Zion who are taking over the world. Jews will not replace us, shouted the self-proclaimed Nazis in Charlottesville, and it was yesterday. Genocide is always promoted as preemptive and defensive, and the constructed enemy of the paranoid is construed as life-threatening. 
the Charlottesville slogan comes as a textbook case of projection. Does not Christianity emerge as a replacement theology? We Christians have replaced the Jews. We are the new Israelites. And after Pittsburgh and the murderous fantasy that Jews are responsible for the white genocide, quote unquote, conspiracy theory is again a burning question. I thus submit the hypothesis, which is more of an intuition, and I don't know if I can even develop it, but maybe in the discussion. I submit the hypothesis that conspiracy theory is what remains of theodicy after the death of God, a magical causality, demonic rather than divine, that gives meaning to a history bereft of a direction. I would like to reflect on the social and psychological phenomena that lead to the identification and the designation of another as one's ontological enemy. Those phenomena can be subsumed under the notion of ontological hatred, a hatred that cannot be rationally explained and that aims at the essence of its object. The category of the enemy pertains to political metaphysics so what retains my attention is thus the metaphysical construction of the enemy, or if you prefer, the construction of a metaphysical enemy. In a striking, uh, it, it's, no, it's not, it's this one, no? It works? Yes. In a striking uh, essay, historian Philippe Burin subsumed Nazi antisemitism under the concept of resentment and apocalypse. Resentment and apocalypse are not limited to Nazi antisemitism. We find it in diverse conspiracy theories on the far right, the far left, and of course in all millenarian narratives of redemptive violence. Those narratives according to which after the total destruction of an arch enemy, the world will finally reach perfection. One could even argue that all metaphysical constructions of an enemy rest on those two pillars, resentment and apocalypse. The elimination of the bourgeoisie for communism, of the Jews and inferior races for the Nazis, of the infidels for the jihadists, of the intellectual during China's cultural revolution, of blacks and Jews for today's neo-Nazis and white supremacists should lead to a sort of end of history. There is a purifying fantasy behind the construction of the metaphysical enemy the advent of a pure humanity or a restored humanity is the goal of metaphysical hostility. Recently, the publication of Martin Heidegger's Black Notebooks has added a new chapter to such apocalyptic thinking. I'll focus briefly on the fascinating and inexhaustible case of Heidegger because it allows us to witness a sophisticated intellectual elaboration of an imaginary foe. For Heidegger, following Oswald Spengler in the early 20th century, the modern West was on the wrong path. Let's say it was decadent. And it was decadent because it had embraced instrumental rationality, commerce, calculation, individualism, and so on, instead of authentic thinking about being which is the true mission of the poet thinker. This refers to Heidegger's famous, if abstruse, phrase, the forgetfulness of being. In Heidegger's idiosyncratic scenario, this decline can be traced back to Plato and Aristotle, since Plato and Aristotle had already turned away from the search for being and reduced metaphysics to logic, and logic will generate an obsession with calculation, measurement, technoscience. Heidegger claimed to recover the search for being in the pre-Socratic thinkers and poets. You see, this sounds very lofty, and one wonders where anti-Semitism and Nazism hide in such an abstract proposition, especially given that Heidegger seems to assert that man has no substance, no essence, or that his essence is his existence. 
So far, we could almost hear Sartre claim that existence precedes essence, except that Sartre, of course, brand his Sartre brand of existentialism was neither declinist nor reactionary, quite the opposite. But if metaphysics went all right, as early as Plato and Aristotle, you can ask me, what do the Jews have to do with it? The Jews, more than anyone or anything else, are, for Heidegger, the hijackers of metaphysics and the main culprits in the reduction of thought to rationality and logic. Why? Because they embody calculation, they embody money, these are <coughs> manuscript fragments of the black notebooks. Uh, because they are into plots, into conspiracies and machinations, what Heidegger calls Machenschaft. For Heidegger, indeed, the Jews stood as the incarnation of the perversion of metaphysics and of the reduction of being to technoscience, the so-called forgetfulness of being. So this sounds again like hardcore metaphysics, but of course here, metaphysical jargon is harnessed to the service of a much more trivial, vulgar, and folkish antisemitism. Jargon dissimulates what Jean-Luc Nancy has aptly called the banality of Heidegger's antisemitism. It is ironic that Heidegger, who claimed that Nazism was not philosophical enough, not lofty enough for his taste, was merely clothing his provincial antisemitism as a hardcore critique of Western metaphysics, a metaphysics allegedly gone all right. It was an exercise in intellectual sublimation, to, to stay polite, the harnessing of philosophy to vulgar hatred, the critique of metaphysics as a fig leaf for all too ordinary hatred. For Heidegger, then, the Jews were the cause of the decline of the West. To be sure, one can be seduced, and I am, by a declinist and reactionary worldview, sometimes I am. One can lament the mechanization of life that began with the Industrial Revolution. One can even argue that metaphysics has forgotten the who of man and reduced man to a what, to a being that can be dissected like a thing. But the problem lies in the designation of the Jew, or any other other for that matter, as responsible for this alleged perversion, decline, and reduction of man to a mere something. Here the Jew becomes the name of an anxiety or a discontent in Western individualism, the fear of fragmentation of the Gemenschaft, the anxiety in the face of the artificialization and mechanization of life. And this is quite a serious allegation. This is ascribing lots of negative and destructive power to the Jews. This is pure metaphysical hatred. In such configuration, the Jew stands as the absolute enemy, the ontological enemy. A couple of months ago, literary journalist Nicolas Veil published an intriguing book on Heidegger, aptly entitled The Mystic of Resentment. Following Peter Travny, Weil argues that Heidegger was one of the first anti-globalist thinkers. In accordance with the anti-Semitic stereotype of the 19th, 20th century, Heidegger considered the Jews as the instruments of globalization and deracination, as well as the agents of a modernity entirely dominated by calculation and measurement. It is that very modernity, the wrong path, of the West, if you will, that Heidegger rejects. The real problem is that Heidegger's critique of what he calls gestalt or unframing, that is the reduction of all beings, nature, human, the earth, and so on, to economic resource, is far from irrelevant, especially in the age of environmental disasters and hydraulic fracking, for the latter encapsulating perfectly the treatment of the earth as a mere resource, rather than a place of dwelling. But we can find other 20th century thinkers, such as those of the Frankfurt School, or Hans Jonas, or Günther Anders, up to Zygmunt Bauman, a warning against unframing an instrumental rationality that never drifts into antisemitism or conspiracy theory, a critique of modernity that is not grounded in the mystic of hatred. Am I, I have no time left. 
I have two pages. Okay, I will now account for my mysterious title, uh, The Doctrine of Hatred. Uh, to this effect, I will turn to a major testimony about Stalin's terror. Written between 1946 and, and 1947, the journey to the land of the Zeka by Julius Margolin appeared in France in 1949 under the title The Inhumane or Inhuman Condition. The first Russian edition would appear in New York in 1952. The circumstances of Margolin's arrestation by the NKVD and his detention in Stalin's camps for five years are truly heartbreaking. This is a case, if there was ever one, of being at the wrong place at the wrong time. Born in the Polish town of Pinsk in 1900, his first language and culture was Russian. Margolin studied philosophy in the early 20s in Berlin, then he settled in Łódź, L-O-D-Z. In 1936, he traveled to Palestine, the Jewish homeland at the time of the British mandate, where his son and wife settled. 1937, Margolin became permanent resident of Palestine, all the while keeping his Polish citizenship. While Margolin was visiting Wuch in 1939, the Second World War broke out. He hides in Pinsk, which is invaded by the Red Army, and is arrested in 1940. Margolin spends five years in camp in the region of Arkhangelsk, in the middle of his book, and that's in the middle of this book that Margolin uh, inserts a philosophical meditation on hatred entitled The Doctrine of Hatred, written during an illness at the camp hospital. His project during this time of leisure is to reflect theoretically about hatred. Margolin seizes this parenthesis in the time of detention and forced labor to think freely, to philosophize in Boetius' tradition of consolatio philosophiae, the consolation of philosophy. While Heidegger found solace in philosophy, for, excuse me, while Heidegger put philosophy at the service of his metaphysical hatred, Margolin found solace in philosophizing, and more importantly, freedom from his passion triste, sad passions. And I quote Margolin, I had somehow overcome my, my own hatred. I was able to master it, to submit it to the judgment of reason, he writes. The prisoner will then devote pages to a cold and lucid classification of hatred. I focus on two types of hatred in that classification. The first that interests me is what he calls odium rationale, the good, the positive, and rational hatred of, I quote, those who take arms to fight the forces of evil, end quote. Margolin deems this hatred transparent and rational to the extent that it causes, that its cause, sorry, is easily definable, identifiable, and that it disappears with the external causes that triggered it. Margolin calls it a counter hatred, superfluous in normal times, but necessary when imposed upon us by an enemy. This affect is incommensurable with the irrational and opaque hatred, the one at work in the Inquisition, Gulag, gas chambers, and so on. And at this juncture, Margolin offers an intriguing hypothesis. Hatred compensates for an internal flow, he says. He writes, I quote, the core of the disease is within us, but we externalize it. As of now, hatred has an address, but it's the wrong address, end quote. Explicitly inspired by Freud's concept of Übertragung or transference, Margolin uses the metaphor of a letter that carries the wrong address. Philosopher Jean-François Lyotard had proposed an analysis of transference also conceptualized in terms of address and destination. For Lyotard, transference is a psychic phenomenon of misdirection and mistranslation of an affect, what Lyotard calls the inarticulate. An affect, a feeling of anxiety perhaps, is floating, never symbolized, because beneath representation. It exists outside articulate language. During the talking cue, the patient will attempt to articulate the affect, but this articulation or wording will always be a mistranslation, a transference or a displacement. Now, of course, in the context of a politics of terror, the fascist leader needs to redirect this unnameable affect to invent an addressee, the Jew, the Hispanic, the West, and so on. 
The politics of hatred thus consists in the designation of an enemy that is supposed to embody the cause of the internal flow or inner weakness. I will, uh, okay, I'll one more thing. If one goes back where we began with the example of the TV uh, show Black Mirror, the flow is ontological. Human beings are imperfect, they are mortal, subjected to all kinds of disease and so on. The regime of terror, a eugenic regime that calls for the coming of a perfect humanity, promotes the extermination of the weak as the final solution to the problem of human vulnerability. In the case of anti-Semitism, Jean-Luc Nancy has recently offered an intriguing theory according to which the Jews are the internal outside or the external inside, if you prefer, a principle that destabilizes the European psyche, which is always already split, but that denies that split between a striving for autonomy, to wit, modernity, and the remainder of heteronomy, to wit, an archaic attachment to the call of God. In the most intriguing part of his argument, Nancy identifies antisemitism as a case of European self-loathing, a phenomenon that pertains to the DNA of European civilization. Nancy argues that European civilization is split between a striving for autonomy and rationality on the one hand, and on the other hand, a longing for an ideal and spiritual accomplishment, the sacrifice of power, materiality, and wealth to something transcendent and higher. Nancy is right to see this split at work in the history of the church. After all, the Catholic Church is built on the paradox of a worldly empire that preaches the rejection of mundane affairs and of worldly concerns. As a result, European antisemitism appears as a case of projection. The Jew comes to embody everything that modern Europe hates about itself, power, money, democracy, technique. For what it's worth, of course, it's an empty theory of antisemitism. This analysis allows us to read Heidegger's at mystic of resentment with Margolin Freudian intuition. The rise of right-wing populism in Europe and in the US, the recent denunciation of the globalist from the bullet pulpit corresponds to this very scenario, a profound discontent in modernity and globalization, a globalization of which everyone, including those who claim to hate it, benefits, is redirected outward by clever demagogues toward imaginary enemies. Thank you, and sorry for the comment. for me to present some thoughts about a specific object that has something to do with the construction, the construction of the enemy and um, you might say an agonistic view onto uh, um, European and world politics. So what I will present in the next 20 minutes is um, the specific object of memory politics, Holocaust memory politics, uh, so I can't come up with, a, uh, with these tremendous metaphors of the fallen angel or uh, the Jew as the defaced enemy. Um, it's a different level that I will present, a level of uh, a discourse that is already recognizing uh, not the enemy but the victim and is trying, is trying to pay uh, honor and uh, tribute to the uh, um, victimized enemy, uh, 
But uh, what I want to highlight in this um, uh, paper is <coughs> simply the fact that uh, memory politics nowadays are uh, under attack from certain um, political directions, and there is a competition between memory politics. In a way, I find this competition helpful, um, and, and I, therefore I try to apply the idea of memory politics and Holocaust memory uh, to the idea of agonistic memory politics, uh, because it is obvious that um, we, we have to consider some kind of competition from the market of limited attention, and we have to consider competition uh, when it comes to the political approach of being victimized. So what I will present is a more, I hope so, a more uh, comprehensive picture of Holocaust politics. Uh, I would like to present first uh, Holocaust memory in the context of the history of colonization. I would like to link me uh, Holocaust memory to the memory of uh, colonization. In a second, very short part, I would like to um, refer to um, an in internal discourse of the European Jewry that um, highlights that um, uh, Jewish identity can be de defined uh, in relation to the Holocaust and victimization, but also um, that there is a figure, the Jewish uh, pariah, that uh, makes it able to have a different understanding of uh, Jewish identity. And I then will shift um, Euro European Holocaust memory uh, in the course. I will show how this shift takes place in the course of the so-called refugee crisis. And in the last, more extensive part, I will um, present you a case study uh, that I um, um, that I found in the center of Berlin, uh, where I will present you some photos. Uh, so I will start with the first part, the construction of the other and the boomerang effect. Antagonistic politics in general, that is the truism, um, depends on the construction of the threatening, uh, threatening other. Carl Schmitz, the concept of the political is the classical text that conceives the essence of polit politics and the justification of violence as based on enmity. According to Schmidt, any consensus requires acts of othering and exclusion, thus ruling out from the outset a global all-embracing consensus. A certain more radical understanding of antagonism characterizes othering as the key element of identifying and combating ethical and cultural, and we might also say uh, religious diversity. Following this second understanding in the long-lasting geopolitics of modernity, aspects of racial superiority and competition were utilized to reinforce the project of cultural domination and physical annihilation. In the past four decades, decolonial research made an effort to identify the age of discovery as the initial effort to conceive the other as the main adversary of modern civilization. In this line of thought, the Grupo Moder Modernidad Colonialidad, I will refer to this group of intellectuals as GMC, Grupo Modernidad Colonialidad, a network of Latin American philosophers, sociologists, semioticians, anthropologists, and literary critics, considers the hegemonic constellation established with the so-called conquest of the Americas from 19, uh, for, uh, 1492 on as the beginning of modernity. Thus, why, for example, the Indian British intellectual Pankai Mishrai declares Napoleon the first imperialist and Voltaire and Rousseau modernity's pivotal thinkers, GMC identifies Hernán Cortés, the Spanish conquistador who caused the fall of the Aztec Empire in the early 16th century as the first modern supremacist. In addition, they declare the Nahua-born La Malinche a woman uh, who was an interpreter between Cortes and Moctezuma, uh, the first transmodern character, a character that tries to establish something like uh, we might call transmodernity. On a more theoretical level, the so-called Junta de Valladolid plays a pivotal role in the considerations of GMC. In 1550, 
the Catholic Church organized the first moral debate in European history to discuss the treatment of the indigenous communities in the colonization of the Americas. While Bartolomé de las Casas, Bishop of Chiapas, argued that the Amerindians are human beings, not different from the colonizers, and thus have to be treated with respect, the theologian Juan Gines de Sepulveda insisted on fundamental cultural differences between colonizers and colonized, accusing the latter of crimes against nature that justify annihilation if conversion would be rejected. The Sepulveda doctrine was predominant in the Western world, to put it in an exaggerated nutshell, until the end of World War II. How can we use this theoretical background to revise and improve our understanding of the legacy of anti-Semitism and the memory of the Holocaust? On the one hand, it proves and that it was not only the Jews who were the original other of Christianity, but almost equi primordially the colonized Amerindians. On the other hand, it explains why in recent studies about modern race, uh, racialization and its civilization of, or the bar uh, barbarism alternative, the reference to Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism has become quite popular for those who want to understand the historical connection between colonialism and anti Semitism. From Aimé Césaire and Franz Fanon to W.E.B. Du Bois and Michael Rothberg, the connection between the Holocaust and European colonialism is being presented under Arendt's concept of the boomerang effect that describes how European nations prepared its own people for the permanent degradation of alien peoples and for the more unintended consequences of imperial throwback. On the other hand, critical approaches to Arendt divide the histories of fascism and colonialism into separate spheres and accuse her of not being able to think beyond the limits of Eurocentrism. Arendt's initial intention, though, was resistant to criticism, namely to reject two central arguments in the prevalent analysis of, Jews fa of the Jews' fate under Nazi dictatorship, the scapegoat argument and the argument of an eternal anti-Semitism. Unveiling the historical conditions of anti-Semitism, Arendt drew attention to the general imperialist patterns of Nazi ideology. In this way, Arendt returned a certain commonplace view of genocide studies to history. As too much of the history of anti-Semitism anti has been overdetermined by the extremities of the Holocaust, it seems as if part of Holocaust memory nowadays is being returned to the substantially broader and more dynamic history of colonization. I will come back to this latter argument later on in my presentation when I'm uh, showing you these images. It was again Hannah Arendt who detected a role in Jewish intellectual life whose importance cannot be overestimated in the understanding of othering, the Jewish pariah. In an essay from 1944, she characterized the role of the conscious outsider, referring to those uh, to contemporary history figures like Heinrich Heine, Rahel Warnhagen, Franz Kafka, and Walter Benjamin, by contrasting it with the role of the parvenu, the Jewish opportunist who tries to integrate in the Gentile's world but always fails. Arendt's conscious pariah is the type of self-confident intellectual who rejects the role of victimhood and creatively uses their status of outsider to cast a critical view on society unachievable from an autochthonous perspective. I will come back to this role of agonistic cultural and political agency first further down when discussing the present and the future of Holocaust memory. So now, it suffices to keep in mind that Arendt's findings show how anti-Semitism and othering did not always result in the clear-cut and humbling victimizations of the Jew. It goes without saying that the construction of the Jew as pariah is in itself a historical one and dependent on specific cultural and political constellations. The example of the already mentioned uh, French philosopher Emmanuel Lévinas shows how quickly this constellation can change. Levinas is prominently referred to 
when cultural discourses turn to the importance of the other in modern ethics. These ethics are to be understood, Bruno explained this uh, um, brilliantly, as the infinite moral demands triggered by the appearance uh, of the other's face. But these demands seem to have a limit. In an interview prominently cited uh, in connection to Levinas' philosophy, the interview Shlomo Malka asked Levinas if for the Israeli, the other isn't above all the Palestinian. Levinas answers, and I'm quoting him, my definition of the other is completely different. The other is the neighbor who is not necessarily kin, but who can be. And in that sense, if you're the other, you're for the neighbor. But if your neighbor attacks another neighbor or treats him unjustly, what can you do? Then authority takes on another, char another character. In authority, we can find an enemy, or at least we are faced with the problem of knowing who is right and who is wrong, who is just and who is unjust. There are people who are wrong." Unquote. The quote clearly uncovers the agonistic confinement of Levinas' philosophy within the different context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It will lead us directly to the key argument of my paper. From the perspective of Euro European memory politics in the 20th century, Walter Benjamin's thesis on the philosophy of history has been widely recognized as a watershed. Facing exile caused by fascist politics, Benjamin urged the historical materialist, uh, materialist to brush history against the grain by focusing on the experiences not of the victors, but of the victims. Starting with the Eichmann trial in Jerusalem and the Auschwitz trial in Frankfurt, European commemoration of the Holocaust and other genocides faithfully followed the, this directive ever since, right through to the Stockholm International Forum of the Holocaust and the declaration of 16 nations to honor Holocaust commemoration as an unquestionable common point of reference for future education. As a consequence, the construction of post-Cold War European identity was based on this common memory. Observance, of January 27, the day of the liberation of Auschwitz, in Germany, Britain, France, Italy, and Scandinavian countries expresses this commitment to the history of victimhood. Nathan Snyder and Daniel Levy have labeled it as the cosmopolitan mode of remembering, maintaining that Holocaust memory has influenced national narratives and triggered transnational solidarity in an unprecedented way. As of now, the era of consensus on values shaped by the experience of the Holocaust might have come to an end. Right-wing populism in various European countries decries visions like borderless society, integration of the immigrating other, and the project of the European community. In Germany, AFD politicians, AFD stands for Alternative for Germany, that's the party of right-wing populism in Germany, AFD politicians like Björn Höcke and Alexander Gauland develop a counter discourse that disparages Holocaust memory from various angles. As a consequence, memory studies start to detect and conceptualize a new approach to remembrance, calling it agonistic memory. The agonists herald the swan, swan, season, swan song season for the Benjaminian and the Habermasian Europe based on the ideas of solidarity and consensus. There are members of this uh, discourse that highlight that cosmopolitan mode, that the cosmopolitan mode based on Holocaust memory runs the risk of being perceived as Eurocentric, push, pushing a universalism based on enlightenment and, in, and ignoring the social necessity of othering. Consequently, these people promote incorporation of the opposed other. In their case, uh, the uh, opposed other is the perpetrator in his own right, and they emphasize passions as a necessary ingredient in order to re reinvigorate memory politics. While I consider the agonistic mode po mode's point of view valid, but slightly exaggerated when it comes to the claim for inclusion of the perpetrating other, I mean, European and especially German memory politics took great pain in reconstructing the role of the perpetrators. The 
so-called topography of terror in Berlin is a prime example for this. It turns out downright damaging when it comes um, to, the con to its conclusion, the claim to provide a uh, arenas for agonistic encounters without mentioning the non-European victims of Western politics. It seems as, as, as if these representatives tend to establish another screen memory. Bringing the perpetrators of the Holocaust center into the spotlight, they blank out the victims of European colonization. If the proposal of agonistic memory politics makes any sense, it should be situated within the contested territory, territory of transmodern global memories of genocides writ large. Let me illustrate my argument with an example that, at least in my opinion, clearly demonstrates the challenge memory politics nowadays have to face in a globalized world. So I'm coming to my example now. In the center of Berlin, the first site you run into visiting the vicinity of the Brandenburg Gate is the Memorial for the Murdered Jews of War. You all know this probably. Um, the difficult task the initiators had to face was to resolve the conundrum of how to represent the memory of the victims in the country of the perpetrators. The abstract quality of the memorial is a clear sign of the attempt to find a compromise. Its accessibility to the general public triggers important questions how other, more conventional memorial sites condition vis visitors <coughs> to a certain behavior. The initiators clearly indicated that its openness might be also understood as providing an arena for contesting approaches to Holocaust memory. Additional memorials to homosexuals and Sinti and Roma persecuted, those are two uh, more memorial sites in the vicinity of the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin. So additional memorials to homosexuals and Sinti and Roma persecuted during Nazism proved that the ori original dedication of the memorial to the Jewish victims was too narrow. On top of that, the already mentioned topography of terror uh, is just a 10 minutes walk from the memorial and documents in great detail how the enemy, the Jews of Europe, was constructed and its extermination organized by the perpetrators. Having said this, I would like to invite you uh, to a Berlin site that confronts us with a more complex constellation in the light of the contested territory of transmodern memory politics introduced above. The so-called Mohrenstraße, and there is another street there in the vicinity, Wilhelmstraße, cut through part of the Mitte neighborhood known for such cultural landmarks as the Brandenburg Gate, Checkpoint Charlie, and the Museum Island. They are somewhat like the Holocaust Memorial's backyard, situated just a minute's walk away from it. Wilhelmstraße is the historical site of Nazi Germany's center of power, as it housed the Third Reich's Chancellery, the Ministry of Justice, and Foreign Ministry. To complicate things, Wilhelmstraße also hosted the so-called Berlin Congo Conference in 1884. The first chancellor of Germany, Otto von Bismarck, had invited the main political powers of Europe to regulate European colonization and trade in Africa, thus eliminating the autonomy of the continent. A plaque at the intersection of Wilhelmstraße and an der Kolonade reminds <coughs> us of the event. What you can see here it depicts uh, an organization of the event, event uh, the, um, the territory, uh, the African territories that was um, affected by this um, conference. Um, so this plaque points at the fact, and I'm quoting from the plaque here, that Africa and the African people were present at the conference only through their opposition to European politics. They were excluded as political subjects not one African participant was invited, unquote. In an interesting act of confrontation or multi-directionality, however you would like to, uh, uh, to uh, refer to it, 
the city of Berlin chose a site just a few yards away from this plaque to honor Georg Elsa, who tried to assassinate Hitler in 1939, but failed. The street can therefore be considered as an urban space where memories of Nazi perpetration, resistance, and colonialism are inextricably intertwined and or confronted. Let me guide you further into the labyrinth of memory politics by coming back to the Mohrenstraße. This street does not accommodate noteworthy museums or historical buildings, but its name is a bone of contention for several years now. In 1706, when the name was used for the first time, Berlin was about to establish a profitable trade relation with the so-called Brandenburg Gold Coast. Prussian colony in what today is the territory of Ghana. The street name uses a designation, Moor, a designation for Africans common in those times. But recently, NGOs push for a renaming, criticizing the colonial context of the street name and highlighting that the fact that German avidly commemorates the Holocaust, but has buried the Herero Nama genocide in the former German Southwest Africa colony in oblivion. This year, protesters claimed to rename the street Anton Wilhelm Amos Street. That was, that's a, a photo of the demonstration and the claim for renaming it. How much minutes do I have? Um, two, but you can ask. <laughs> <laughs> so I have some two pages left. Um, Amo, first a slave in the before mentioned Gold Coast and then gifted to the Duke of Braunschweig Wolfenbüttel, was the first African known to have attended a European university, receiving a doctorate in philosophy at the university in Halle in, in 1734. His dissertation on the impassivity of the human mind, that's the cover of the, his dissertation, dealt with the metaphysics of René Descartes. Amo argued, that, uh, argued against the Cartesian dualism of mind and body, favoring a materialist account of the human subject. To further map out my argument, I would like to share with you an experience I made. That's an excursus, but it's very interesting. I made some time ago at the Department of Philosophy of a Western University. A so-called mock job talk had been organized to give a recently graduated student the opportunity to prepare for the application procedure common in academia. The candidate, a postdoc of African American de uh, descent, announced that he would introduce Anton Wilhelm Amo, his philosophy and his life, as was unambiguously remarked at the beginning of his presentation. Equally unambiguous and all the more surprising was the following confession of our speaker. Although he would present the main arguments of Amo's PhD thesis, he would like to declare here and now that he has no interest in it at all. His sole interest would be on Amo's life. You can imagine the bewilderment in the audience. Why would a postdoc in philosophy desperately looking for a job in academia emphatically neglect the philosophical approach of his protagonist. During his uh, presentation, I was brooding over an explanation. All of a sudden, a quote from Robert, Robert Bernasconi, professor of philosophy in African American studies at Penn State University, came to my mind. I'm quoting Bernasconi. Western philosophy traps African philosophy in a double bind. Either African philosophy is so similar to Western philosophy that it makes no distinctive contribution and effectively disappears. Or it is so different that its credentials to be genuine philosophy will always be in doubt." Unquote. It might be that our job seeker's rejection to take interest in Amos philosophy was an expression of, his double, of this double bind and the protest against it. By the way, a presumption later confirmed by the speaker himself. Few of the professors present approved, uh, present approved this approach. The catch-22 situation just described 
leads to the question what prospects AMO and lesser known victims of coloni colonialism have to, re have to receive an unbiased attention from Western academia. Growing criticism of the project of modernity points to the fact that the humanities in the West still reject to broaden their understanding of memory studies and to diversify their curricula. In philosophy departments, the breaches are particularly uh, evident. That's my field, so I, I'm speaking here. It's my own experience. But I would like also to refer to, uh, to two of my colleagues, Jay Garfield and Brian von Norden, two of the organizers of the annual non-Western philosophy conference at UPenn. They point to the fact that the top 50 philosophy doctoral programs in the English-speaking world, uh, from these top 50 programs, only 15% have any regular faculty member who teach any non-Western philosophy. So the conclusion of my two colleagues is, I'm quoting, philosophy as a discipline has a serious diversity problem. Philosophy departments are nothing but temples to the achievement of males of European descent. If nothing happens, they recommend, let's be honest and call departments of European American philosophy what they are, unquote. In memory studies, the situation is quite similar. A transgenocidal approach, including colonization, is still an exception in the field. I'm coming to my conclusion. It goes without saying that global migration flows, the European refugee crisis, and growing right-wing populism in the midst of democratic countries pose a serious challenge to higher education. Academic teachers, it might seem, cannot rise to it by preparing students just to a clearly defined workplace within their corresponding national cultures. Higher education and memory politics need to go a step beyond this one dimensionality to, fill, to fulfill its purpose. I propose to adopt a transmodern approach. Transmodernity, a term introduced by the Spanish philosopher Rosa Maria Rodriguez Magda, imagine a woman in the philosophy department, incredible. And the Argentine Mexican theologian Enrique Bussel criticizes both criticize the conceptual grounding of the new grand narrative, globalization, or in our uh, case, Holocaust memory. It proposes to provincialize Western onto-epistemologies and memory politics by including knowledge and narratives of remembrance developed by the other, i.e. Latin American, African, and Asian community. The prefix trans indicates the claim for a symmetry and recognition and implementation of different symbolic orders and narratives. To achieve such symmetrical conditions, epistemic disobedience is essential. Agonistic memory in this context would mean that Holocaust memory has to be situated within a battle for attention together with other equally disturbing narratives of suffering and perpetration. Thus, transmodernity could be understood as a claim for new associations of reason and remembrance, a diversity of local and translocal, in fact, transcultural blueprints for communication under duress of limited attention. Let me conclude <coughs> I attempted to show in the first step that contemporary Holocaust memory needs to be intertwined with the history of colonization. In the second step, I intended to redefine agonistic memory, not primarily as the urge to include a passionate picture of the perpetrator, but as a history of the Jews as pariah and their coming to terms with the fact that other stories of genocide and suffering constitute a ground for contestation. In the last step, I showed in an example how such a ground of contestation is being constituted in Berlin. Hopefully, you will accept my invitation to contest my argument. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'd like to comment and extend some of the comments uh, that Ralph made over this mattering of uh, 
interventions by Bruno, particularly about the relationship between the Holocaust and colonialism. Um, one of the really fascinating pictures that Ralph paints for us is this urban landscape in which he communicates the boomerang effect that uh, of Hannah Arendt on, on urbanist totalitarianism uh, by taking us to Berlin and connecting the memorials with colonialism. And even though across the centuries, uh, those who walk those streets, one being the backyard, uh, of, as, as you put, of the Holocaust, really is a stunning account in which memories are overlaid upon each other, one being the background or the mirror uh, of one another, and each in some ways invoking metaphorically uh, that they're not only mirrors, but each logically explain the other. That colonialism and the Holocaust can't be ripped from one another. That, that history seems to uh, have logics that produce both. But one of the things that, if we can just ask the question is, what are the costs or the worries of speaking about the Holocaust in a manner in which it's an analogical, analogizable, uh, that we make analogies or metaphors uh, to other forms of suffering like colonialism. And one thing is that the Holocaust is ineffable. The brutality, the marked bureaucracies that, uh, in which people are sent over with trains, all highly organized, all controlled and, and determined by individuals, bureaucrats, civil servants, that are supposed to promote the public good, but to them, it means folks being pushed um, in huge overpopulated numbers in trains. You can just smell the defecation. There's no access to toilets. There's a, there's a scent of urine. People being uh, disembarked, and then they see smoke. The smoke, the result of human flesh. And so that level of suffering, as you can tell by just invoking it, the sense that we don't speak of when we abstract by saying the Holocaust, those are the types of things that make us say, whoa, I, let's not speak anymore, this is so ineffable. And so uniqueness is connected to the ineffability of the Holocaust. We want to keep it separate. We want it to shine with a certain form of exceptionalism because the suffering is so great, the bureaucracy and the evil tactics so unimaginable. And yet if we separate it, we also then don't learn. We don't historicize. We don't remember. We bury it, we ignore it, because suddenly it's something that stands alone. And somehow memory and, and association with things that happen to us today is part of the way that we think and that we actually recall the past. Uh, and so the, this tension that Ralph brings out in it by Berlusconi's, uh, that Western philosophy traps African philosophy in the double bind in reference to uh, the dissertation that he, had, that he heard, uh, that either African philosophy is so similar to Western philosophy that makes no distinctive contribution, effectively disappears, or it's different and its credential to genuine philosophy will always be in doubt. Similarly, you can think, by the way, of the Holocaust if we have it be so ineffable and, and uncomparable to other things, then in some ways its uniqueness can lead to disappearance. And if we do connect it to other violations of human rights, to colonialism, then in some ways it can also be buried because of the many examples of suffering that we see on an ongoing basis. And so it's a paradox. But yet anti-Semitism has such strong connections and such uh, re uh, obvious uh, qualities that are repeating themselves if we look at the United States, for example. Uh, the, the way in which conspiracies have emerged about Muslims, a form of Islamophobia in which torture is perceived as something that ought to be done, that violations of human rights need to take place when it comes to Muslims because uh, they, are, they are prone to terrorism, that they are outside of the mark of civilization. And so it's, it recalls us, by the way, in the Holocaust, the Musenmai, 
the Jews would be referred to when they're thoroughly exhausted. And the, this idea of the Muslim having to constantly condemn terrorism as though they were representative of all the religions and of every Muslim, wherever they commit an act, anywhere around the planet, perpetual, perpetually under the guise of suspicion, the conspiracies that Bruno referred to, that mark our modernity. And so this reminds us of the importance of potentially having the Holocaust do work for us to think of it as the basis from which we developed a language of human rights. In 1948, the Convention on Genocide, the term genocide by uh, Raphael Lemkin coined, the very term we use, right, emerges from those very acts uh, of travesty that took place in the heart of Europe. <laughs> and in that sense, we can see that metaphorizing or making comparisons can be very productive. Uh, and this reminds me, in, if we think about the social sciences, in psychology, there's all these studies that, whenever I, that, that on racial bias. Uh, that, for example, there are studies that show um, uh, you can have two effectively similar CVs, and you send them out into the world, it's like an empirical study. And uh, you then wait for the callbacks. And the CVs that are effectively identical but the ones that have African-American coded names like Jamal versus the ones that have white coded names like Brendan get much fewer callbacks. And not only that, we also know that African-Americans who don't have a criminal record have fewer callbacks than whites who have a criminal record as revealed on their CVs. Or the iPod with a white hand advertised gets many more sales than with a black hand in the photo. Or in sale, when you sell a car, uh, a salesman will often have a higher price for an African American versus someone who's white. Or the doctor who doesn't recommend a particular treatment for an African American as opposed to whites. These implicit biases are very much part of the way that we operate. But let me, let me think about this as an alternative to this psychological approach. There's a historical and institutional one. And it's reminiscent of Hannah Arendt. Um, the, we can think of racial bias not as these psychological moments in which individuals make decisions for CVs or sell a car or uh, an iPod or provide a treatment as a physician. But we can think about all of them, the physicians, the potential employers, uh, these marketers and sellers of cars and iPods, as part of a larger structure of history. And this was perhaps one of the most uh, fundamental ways in which we might think of Edward Said's Orientalism. That it's not, uh, let's focus and find moments of racism dis displaced or dis dis detached from one another happening all across a system but rather that the whole system is itself a, a logic, uh, a logic in which racial bias then finds expression institutionally, that Arabs are just naturally inferior in a world that dis has countless historical accounts that document uh, Arabs and Muslims as exotic or barbaric backward, and therefore cast as other, but not as an individual act, but as a historical manifestation of events taking place over centuries. And this is maybe one way in which we can understand places like France, in which uh, the Islamophobia <coughs> that we hear, or uh, the, when uh, President Sarkozy mentioned uh, 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 in, in, the, in the banlieue with such ease, the perception of how Muslims are in their location in France, and the rise of Islamophobia that was referred to the attacks on mosques, we can see this as not merely uh, acts of separate racial bias, but as colonialism, persisting in the hearts of France, and not that Algeria is in France. And this can be understood by an American who knows of the history of slavery, the history of segregation, of Jim Crow, and its perpetual reemergence in the United States, almost so difficult it constantly, so difficult to remove, it constantly recycles itself. 
And not only that, but how institutional structures actually also produce the victim, uh, the Muslim and the Jew. This is reminiscent of the, of the statement that Ralph mentioned uh, by Gershom Scholem, uh, and the frustration he had with Jews trying to assimilate, and that today we have the good Muslim and the bad Muslim, and the good Muslim seeking to constantly reaffirm their identity by saying things like, we, we are like you, we are American, um, constantly perpetually desiring this particular status of being equal. And yet also the way in which scholarship in my field positions Islamic law or Islam as separate for human rights. Almost like the, qu the question itself answers uh, the question. That, that the answer is embedded in the very way that the scholarship is presented, that they're somehow exclusively separated from one another. And this then produces the Laura Bushes, who then invoke women's rights on the, uh, 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 as, as justification for the occupation and uh, attacks in Afghanistan. These logics are clearly interrelated. Colonialism, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, indeed a blind spot, as referred to by Ralph. And here might be something really crucial for us to also take into account, that uh, in this discussion of agonism that's set up quite uh, beautifully by Ralph, is that a cosmopolitanism itself, which is sometimes juxtaposed from agonism, can itself be co-opted. The dehumanization and lack of empathy that Bruno refers to, uh, that civilization somehow belongs to us and not the Muslims and not the Jews. That and this might be a part and parcel of Orientalism uh, and that self-perceived histories of tolerance and pluralism uh, pro create a situation in which in exchange for having existence and citizenship, then somehow there's also justification for expulsion for the existence of the bad Muslim, for the good Muslim to constantly reassert the right for themselves to live and to be without attack and without stereotype. The way in which modernity in the form of naïcité is used as a weapon um, to attack those who decide to wear veils and niqabs, and the way that it's used to expel people, deport people in the name that they will eventually commit acts of violence, even without proof in Guantanamo, or the way in which they're cast as the ultimate enemy because they must be inherently violent even if they don't exercise any violence, like in the genocide in Myanmar. It reminds us that cosmopolitanism itself can be an instrument of genocide and of human rights violations. If you recall, wrote Lord Cromer, the governor of Egypt during his colonial uh, period, he spoke of a lack of women's rights in Egypt as a justification for colonialism, and yet he was against suffrage in his home country in England. The victim is the enemy. Somehow the victim and the enemy can be conflated, but, but in cases of genocide, we sometimes come to a conclusion in which we think, whoa, here is an enemy to modernity, but we then look back to the Holocaust and we realize they were always the victim. We promised tolerance, and in exchange, we attacked a type of diversity in which uh, we decide that in exchange for being present in society, for having a place, you have to assimilate in manners and in ways that still may make you susceptible to attack. And if I may say something about the perpetrator and the agonism, um, one thing that is really important is that the perpetrator in recent psychological research has been shown to also experience trauma. So the torturer also experienced trauma as much as the, the person who's tortured. And so you can think of a whole recreation of a culture like Rwanda, in which Tutsis and Hutus themselves have almost recreated each other in this way in which we might want to include the perpetrator. Not as necessarily an other, but as part of a production of a whole new society that has to come to grips with itself. In the same way that we think of the landscape in Berlin, 
all intermeshed into one another, affecting each other's identities on an ongoing perpetual basis. And so in a sense, I have difficulty even thinking about this as constructing the other. In many ways, when we think of the victim as, as, as the, that the enemy is ultimately the victim, the victim the enemy, that colonialism is embedded in genocide, that human rights violations are connected to anti-Semitism, that actually the Jew is experiencing like the Muslim, and each of us are a metaphor for one another, that the attack on a synagogue in my Islamophobia course here at the University of Minnesota was one in which we talked about it as though it was an attack on a mosque. That were each metaphors for each other suggest even the perpetrator and the victim, the enemy, all of these are characters that are not part of a production of other, but are a production of different forms of us's. Different forms of us's in which part, fun or parts of the us that we're creating are an us that's degraded, an us that makes us feel better and shores up our own identity. But somehow they're so entangled with one another, we can't separate the Hutu from the Tutsi, the Muslim from the Jew, the German from the Jew. After all, as Ruth Kluger puts, in our hearts we all know that some aspects of the Shah have been repeated elsewhere today and yesterday and will return in new guise tomorrow. And the camps too were only imitations, unique imitations to be sure, of what had occurred the day before yesterday. Thanks.
sometimes um, you, uh, you need to consider these connections between different um, uh, memories and different uh, relations to actually gen to genocides. But uh, it is so important to highlight that um, these memories are suffering from this, this um, necessary limit of attention. So what I was proposing was not that I'm criticizing Michael Rothberg's approach. Um, and uh, I didn't, I criticized the, in fact, the agonistic approach to, to, to memory. But I was, what I would want to highlight is simply the fact that we need to concentrate on the, uh, uh, um, uh, in, in, uh, we need to concentrate on these connections, on these uh, fights against, uh, um, or these fights that result in a redescription, uh, a palimpsestic approach that you are um, overs overwriting certain memories and that these overwritings take place in the history of memory cultures. And that um, uh, and you have to face the fact that uh, the staple memory of Holocaust, uh, um, the Holocaust genocide, um, is being contested in Berlin. It is contested, and uh, the contest, the, con the, the contesting this uh, um, uh, memory discourse means that um, people are uh, proposing um, to write a more complex story, but that probably the complexity will not be accepted by the general public, and that this rejection of the complexity is a real problem because then agonistic memory politics result in antagonistic memory politics. And then you have a, a real problem because then uh, I have the feeling uh, the result is uh, what is uh, Höcke and Gauland are doing, the right-wing populists in, in Germany, that they are simply attacking Holocaust memory and not trying to add another memory to it and saying we have to be more complex, we have to be more comprehensive. It's not only about the Holocaust. So the, the, the discussion about the Guerrero Nama genocide in Germany is now boiling up. It's now boiling up. Everybody's saying, well, we are commemorating the Holocaust. What, what about the Guerrero Nama? And that's a very recent development. And we have to consider this. We can't say, well, our staple memory is the Holocaust memory and full stop. We have to consider that there is a, so to say, a market out there and um, people are coming up with different proposals and you have to consider them all.